uh, those who have come out today on a Friday afternoon. So yeah, most of the time I'm a researcher at the Human Computer Interaction Lab, 33 years going, interdisciplinary between computing and high school, and uh, also with links to psychology, sociology, education, journalism, and the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities Myth. Uh, you can see 750 technical reports and uh, 200 videos and uh, 40 pieces of software on the website, or you can look at our five minute video, which is uh, quite stunning. We're at work. I'm very intensely busy with book projects. Uh, the sixth edition of Designing User Interface is cooking. I just left our team phone call. The sixth edition will have six co authors, but I've assembled a team. Captain Clay has been my collaborator for more than 25 years. So that's quite wonderful to uh, have. She was part of the fifth edition and the fourth edition, but now we've got a total of six authors and we're working to make that happen. So that's kind of where I spend my time. But the research, uh, I just wanted to say one little note um, that you know my, my active effort is about uh, event analytics, particularly electronic history, electronic patient history. So this is a little story just to give you an idea of what I do with much of my time at a children's hospital in a trauma bay. And when these kids arrive, sometimes unconscious or severely injured from them, uh, the, the protocol says you have to check four things. Airways, breathing, circulation, disability, ABCD. You get two minutes to do that. And then seven minutes for secondary survey. Roll baby over, take off the clothes, child. Check if any bruises, wounds, burns, rashes, cuts. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, you get seven minutes to do that, and the question the manager was asking was, how often do they get this right? So they set up a video camera in this emergency room and videotape, and then had someone timestamp when these things happen. And they gave us and then many other events. So we get a timeline which has timestamps on it, and if you look at the data in the tool, it's kind of easy. Regina gave me this wonderful point. Of, there we go. So looking at an individual patient, you can see airways and breathing, disability, would check central pulse. Those are the timestamps for each of these patients. Uh, and the secondary <coughs> survey is a little bit of a line. This one was pretty quick. This one took a lot longer. And sometimes they get even longer. So this is 216, a very small database. And here's what they all look like here. This is what we call, quite politely, the confetti approach. Uh, you know, which just shows this overwhelming amount of detail. But the red line, which is the airway, that happens with about 135 patients. You can see that right away. And for another 50 of them, the first thing that happens before the airway, they actually get oxygen, which is another different kind of event. Not on the protocol list, but that's what happened first. And then for others, uh, they, they you know, check the breathing first rather than do the airways. So, that's kind of what you see. But then you see some of these anomalies, like these very long secondary surveys that took 30 minutes or longer. That's way out of range. And you get an overview of this. I see Jonathan looking at this. And yes, we've done this with security histories, too. Uh, both attacks on Honeypot websites, as well as insider threat activities. So those things do get done. So event flows are a big deal. And if you start filtering and organizing, uh, selecting only the ABCD and secondary survey events, you get a much simpler view and you begin to see, and with a little more work, you get to see that half the patients did A, B, C, D, and then secondary survey. Pretty good, okay? So that's normal. Now we could get rid of those, and then you can see, I hope, the most common error. That's what the managers wanted to know. What's the most common deviation from ABCD? There it is. Can you tell me what it is in words? Thank you. They start a secondary survey early, and disability check gets done afterwards. Okay, so you get to see, and you can see under those conditions, actually, the secondary survey takes somewhat longer. So, and there's other anomalies that show up. And there are 29 ways in which they violate the protocol, and you can sort of read them out. Some of them are not that important. Some of them are more important. You can see reversals of order. About 30 of the patients, the first thing that happened was a breathing check gets done. What? Well, oops. Well, maybe breathing check getting done is a good idea. Uh, so they began to look and redo these kinds of things. But this is what I spend a lot of my time on, on larger data sets when you get, Adobe's got trillions of, of clicks, but let's say 
hundreds of millions of, of customer histories of which websites they visited and did they buy something or not. And so we're doing that for Adobe. And I have to say, I'm very proud of since yesterday we concluded a year's worth of negotiation with Oracle, uh, which has supported us for three years before. But this fourth year, they said, actually, we want the license to use this and put it into our, our medical history and, and uh, randomized clinical trial tools called Empirica, Oracle Empirica. And so that took a year to negotiate uh, with the Oracle and the university lawyers. And last night, we did it. So <laughs> I had a celebratory mood. Uh, and so that will continue to support our, uh, our work here. All right, but today, as Pamela suggested, this is a bit of a different story. And it's been my ruminations over my career, but over the last two years, wrestling with this idea of how to write a book and tell the story. So part of it is a guide for junior researchers. Some of you are students and young faculty and maybe trying to figure out how to make your way as a success story as a researcher in the existing system. Good, I think I can help you. Uh, the second is a manifesto for senior researchers, university administrators, business leaders who are doing research or supporting research, and funding agencies like NSF uh, to think about how to reframe the nation the notions of research agendas and methods, and I'll particularly focus on teamwork, when done right, can produce high impact. And one of the dramatic changes we'll get to is teamwork. I'm pleased that the book site is up for the book, and I can't resist, here's a few of the flyers if any of you want. This is my first version of the flyer. Uh, so I'm starting, I gave my first public talk at the business group downtown on Tuesday, so I'm beginning to tell the story. And the story suggests that three things have happened that are substantially, causes us to reframe the nations of research and change the way we've been doing it or change the way I've been doing it since I was a student uh, or a young researcher. First is the problems of the 21st century are dramatically different than the ones of the 19th and 20th century. I mean, just think back, Louis Pasteur coming through with the germ theory of disease to both explain vaccination and fermentation problems, okay? I mean, just realize how short a time ago it was that we didn't even know about germs and microbes and certainly not viruses, and certainly by 1951, we'd get Watson and Crick coming through with DNA, and 2000, the human sequencing of the human genome. So the problems now are more about healthcare delivery how do you organize a $2 trillion industry in this country so that you can do obesity reduction and smoking cessation and cancer prevention and make hospitals work in an effective and economic uh, way? Uh, environmental sustainability, climate change effects, community safety, disaster response. These are large questions that are you know, way beyond understanding is Pluto out there uh, and have dramatic consequences. I mean, there's good news that the world is getting to be a better place. Poverty and illiteracy and, and is, is much reduced around the world. Um, and there's good news, but there's still much to be done. Okay. So I would suggest the problems are different. They are more often socio-technical, cybersecurity, right? <laughs> it's not a matter of is it computable, but it's a matter of how do you organize the worldwide internet structure that includes six billion users so that security is, you know, is possible. Okay. Second is the new technologies. The very appearance of the web has changed science and research and engineering in dramatic ways. Not only accessibility of documents, dramatic change. Uh, 30 years ago, researchers read about 175 page papers a year mostly from paper documents in a small number of journals to which they subscribed, okay? That model is gone. Researchers now read about 400 papers a year and uh, only a small fraction from paper, mostly on the screen, printed, and from a very different, much more diverse set of journals than they used to. Okay? And where do they learn about these things if they don't get it in the mail as paper document? Through social media, email, listservs, discussion groups, recommendations. The majority, the majority come by recommendation and electronically. And I think most, you know, have, people have not recognized the implications. 
Of course, the collaboration technologies dramatically enhance the possibilities to work together, and that has raised the ambitions. That's the third major social change, is that research teams now have much greater ambitions than they used to. 25, 30 years ago, the test of a new medication or a treatment would involve 80 or maybe 800 participants at a single hospital, and now a typical test of a new procedure would be eight hospitals around the world and 8,000 or more uh, participants. So the vastly greater ambition of teams and then the higher expectations that come from the research managers, the policy people, the business leaders. We have dramatically greater expectations for delivery. Okay. So how do we respond? I claim that there's two guiding principles to reframe the way we think about research. Okay? The first is the ABC principle, or the first version of ABC, applied in basic combined. Now, this sounds straightforward, the idea that you work on real problems, and you apply theoretical frameworks and knowledge, and then you go back to the real problems and test your theories, refine your theories, and you publish the theories, and you solve the problem. I think people in this room and a lot of people say, oh yeah, sure. However, it's a vast deviation from the existing paradigm which was promoted by Vannevar Bush in his 1945 manifesto called Science, the Endless Frontier. And what he proposed was you do basic research first, and then you look for applications, and then you develop a product and you go to market. It's a great idea, and this linear model is still fixed in many people's minds. The only trouble is, it rarely works. And in spite of many scholars and researchers making the point this doesn't work, we're still stuck with that as the model of defense funding, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. We're still stuck with it in many circles within NSF and in the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. If you read, the, what really triggered my writing this book was in the November 2012 report about innovation in the United States, which was written by the ghost of Vannevar Bush, okay? And repeated this mistaken interpretation of history, claiming, for example, that Bell Labs was organized as a basic research facility, okay? Clearly not true if you read John Gentner's book about the idea factory. Everyone who talks about Bell Labs would say, driven by applied problems. Okay, that's where the transistor came from. That's where Claude Shannon's information theory came from. That's where Arno Penzias's PhD about the cosmic radiation, background radiation, came from trying to reduce background noise for microwave communication. Driven by real problems, you actually can make basic research progress, or you're more likely to. Okay, so that's the shift of agenda, but when I say this, some places say, oh no, we must do basic research first. And we should, unfettered is the word the Neighbor Bush used, that academics would be allowed to. Now, the Neighbor Bush was responding in 1945 to the end of the war, and he had to have a little payback for his buddies who had come to Los Alamos to build the bomb. And it, the payback was, you know, when you get back to your universities, we will supply you with funding for your basic research. Unfettered, okay? And uh, that was maybe okay for a while, but we're still living mistakenly in that belief. Okay, so the new agenda says you work on applied problems, real problems, real users, real data, and you apply theoretical frameworks, you publish results, and you solve problems. We could complain either way that the applied researchers who work on their own and solve a problem and don't publish, that's a bad thing. And the theoreticians who make their basic research and publish, but doesn't find much relevance, uh, it's not a good idea. But even Bush suggested that basic research would inevitably find application. It may take a few years, but that's just not true. And repeatedly, the stories show that basic research, I mean, maybe the most the classic is the Air, the, uh, Air Force, um, study called Project Hindsight, where when they built the B-1 bomber, the question was what projects supported by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research were manifested in developments for the B-1 bomber? They found zero. 
And it's a pretty dramatic story. Of course, there's controversial interpretations and people who don't want to have that story told. But you look and see agencies like DARPA, which have much closer alignment to this. And the movement in Washington is from think tanks to do tanks. And getting active and getting our students to be active and work on real problems, real data, real users, is, I think, the way to take us to forward. Anybody want to come back and challenge that or ask about that? Okay. Part of it is a, a little bit of interpretation. I'm thinking, you mentioned about the nuclear bomb, and I'm thinking about the quantum physics that underlie that 50 years earlier. Okay. To some extent, they were motivated also by some experiments, yeah. for so, example. But yeah, I mean, that's often. Didn't Einstein work on basic research on his own? You know, wasn't Niels Bohr working? You could, you could find examples. Oh, and what's that? And when Shannon's theory came out, I think people derided it because they said it was disconnected from what happened. Yeah. And yet it opened up the visual aid. But Shannon is one of the examples I use because he worked on applied research problems. That's how he got to information. Yeah, yeah but when it came out, it certainly the connection okay. was the rather thin, right? I think you're responding to John's point about it's subject to interpretation. And yes, as I say, the PCAST report had an interpretation of history that just seemed incorrect to me. So you may not buy my arguments, or you yeah, may I want to. Talk, did you have time, actually? Yeah, or, 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 go ahead. So, so you, it's interesting you mentioned this uh, Penzias uh, example, because there was you know, basic, work, basic research that led to Nobel Prize, right? So motivated by producing background noise for radio transmission. What's interesting to me is that he was like, he started with the classical problem, but then was able to go off and spend, I, I guess, a number of years working on a completely theoretical aspect of it. Whereas from a funding agency point of view, if they see the slide, they would say, no, we, we want the results by the end of six months, and if you haven't solved the theory, then you stop working yeah. on it and do the best you can do. Okay. And they have made, maybe strongly stated the problem. John, you want to comment before all this kind of stuff? I, I used to be a physicist and kind of still consider myself a positive one, and I became an engineer. And I just wanted to ask, what department are you from again? <laughs> because I, I come from a basic science yeah. background, and, Quite often what I found is that where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think my own... I'm not sure the physics yeah. department and the biology department would see things the same. I understand. Yeah. I you take your point. I, mean, I think it's, it's certainly uh, in sync with the fact that there should be a back and forth between applying and basic. I'm wondering if you aren't really pushing it a little bit too far just for oh, rhetorical purposes. <laughs> Or I we take the point that theoretical research by itself probably can be the end, but also as I think uh, Jonathan mentioned, uh, applied research with extremely harge deadlines is also not going to get very far. There's fact, many are, dangers. In fact, many of the problems that you mentioned yeah. be big problems. I seriously doubt that they will be just solved as a applied problem for a second. Well, we could go back to the Manhattan Project where there was a serious deadline. They actually produced the result of making a bomb, yep. and they so developed the sources were in place. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah there are dangers also of working too close with industry, <coughs> which is sort of the theme I'm getting to. Take the Volkswagen story of recent weeks or other Pepsi Cola. There's a lot of dangers for doing things that too much hew to the agenda of of corporations, so that's a, that's another challenge you get here. But I see that the need to shift the balance, let's say, towards working together and working on no problems. In the sense that I would say academics are smart people. However, they don't know how to choose problems well. Okay, they often make poor choices in problems they work on. They develop these esoteric theoretical frameworks which don't live on and don't propagate well. If they have a connection with industry, Dave Patterson in computer science is a great example. Working with real problems, he would say, accelerated the AMP lab at Berkeley and its worldwide success. So we could talk more, for example, let me, let me hold it. Let's take second driving principle is SED, <coughs> which says that the methods of science, and I grew up in the age of of uh, Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and science was research. Okay, so I started out becoming a scientist, studying physics, and going that route. But 
I'm a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And my book is called Designing the User Interface. And as I looked at these, I thought, well, there we know what the scientific method is. Debate it. And what is the engineering method? What is the method of engineering research? That's a good discussion. And often talked about prototyping and refining prototypes, also modular decomposition, and a few other principles. And then, what is design? Is design a different thing? Dan Moat, our former president, now head of the National Academy of Engineering, sees a grand distinction between science, which is trying to understand the world as it is, engineering, trying to build the world of the future. When I asked him about, what about design? He said, well, design is part of engineering. He just sort of swooped it up. The designers won't take that. And I began to see in my career, in my lifetime, the growth of design as a distinct and powerful subfield. And I wasn't confident yet in making that claim. And so I began to look for a little bit of, you know, so, so my, the, the point of this is that we should be teaching our students these multiple methods, the scientific method, the engineering method, the design method. We should have them work on projects with each of these ways of thinking. Design thinking is a distinct and very different approach to solving problems than the scientific method. Designers resist the pressure to scientize design. They have a word about it. They don't want to be scientized, to be made like scientists. And they claim special skills, abilities, and outcomes if you think like a designer. It's the design thinking notions of IDO, it's what Stanford's D School, Design School teaches, <coughs> RISD, OCAD, SCAD, and other design schools teach. Unfortunately, Maryland is very weak in having a design college and having design as part of our education. And my, my sensitivity about this was, well, let me accelerate or improve by going to the Google Engram viewer and all books in English and I only show you 1900 to 2000, the term engineering appears often, the term science appears often, but look what happens. Design goes up and after 1975 crosses and becomes the dominant topic of discussion in books. So this wasn't just Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive, but there's a, you know, this suggested a broad cultural shift that increased the presence of design. Let me take a pause. Yeah. What's the definition of design? Are you including things like uh, aesthetic appeal as part of design? Uh, yeah, there's, there's three separate chapters of what is science, what is engineering, what is design. So design is, I mean, engineering is usually described as fulfilling requirements to achieve a, a, a stated goal. Designers think that they are much more about collecting requirements, questioning goals, <laughs> refining the requirements, refining the goals, and including in that, not just architecture as a design field, where there's you know, the world, but even landscape design. Chip design might be a different kind of design, but there's less of aesthetic qualities to it. So your point was there's a range of aesthetics. Design goes towards the direction of art or craft. But in the book, I limit myself. I don't address art and philosophy and mathematics and other, you know, I'm focusing on what I call these three disciplines, science, engineering, and design. Oh dear, <laughs> I, I, we don't go there, but right. Well, but, but in graphic design, well, graphic design fits design. Yes, okay. I would. Graphic design usually has a purpose, which is to inform people. Graphic, and designers in generally think of their role as strong in empathy for the users, addressing the aesthetic and other ethical issues which they feel even engineers don't address and scientists rarely do. Scientists will say, that's not on, that's not my topic, okay? Okay, well, Lucy, you get a chance. Yeah, what are those algorithms designed for? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that gets you closer to the mathematics, and so that's it. But I think uh, there's a shift there as well. So we sometimes use design when I wouldn't say it fulfills all the principles yeah, that designers have. But I would say, and maybe we'll come back to it, 
I'm quite charmed by NSF's recent program called Algorithms in the Field where they require the partnership of a theory person and a domain expert. No, no, but uh, that just the, the fact yeah. that you need so many designs. Yeah. Not, uh, you as there's about, if you go to Wikipedia, there's a list of about 30 fields that consider themselves design from every I about these statistics. Yeah, okay. So I wasn't sure one data point like this is not enough to change you. And then while I was writing the book, the New York Times released their system called Chronicle that gives you access to all the pages of the New York Times, searchable in the same way, and look what I found. Um, scientist appears, engineer appears, but designer, once again, 1975, it crosses over to be the dominant topic. And this sort of was an aha moment for me of saying, hey, you know, I've been growing in my attention to design, and it's not just me, um, that design is really a dominant topic, and yet in engineering and in science, we don't get the full story about design, nor do we teach the design method. And what's the design method? There's many versions of that. Uh, in the book, I tend to like the British one, which is called the Double Diamond, which has a divergent exploration of gathering of requirements, and then converging on a design, and then again, divergent about how to implement the design, and then converging on actually building. So what's the difference between engineering and design? Well, I, I just saying that. That, uh, that engineering tends to be, given a set of requirements, I will now iterate to build prototypes based on performance metrics that I've been given, or that I invent or I study, you know, to convert, to get closer towards a better design by modular comp components. This is Brian Arthur's discussion. And so I, I would say that the modularity uh, is a key aspect in the prototype building and refinement of actual prototype. Whereas design is much more of an expansionist view that addresses stakeholders and includes them, that deals with an empathic approach and sensitivity to human values, ethics, and takes a broader view of redefining what the goals are. Now, again, engineers like Dan Boat would say, hey, we do that. Okay. And scientists would say we do that, all right? And so there's a kind of fluid boundary here, and I would say I've run into people feeling my sharp lines separating these three disciplines are too sharp. Oh, you could see, but I felt it was useful as an exposition approach to say. You're making a point. That's you're making a point. I think there's enough difference, and I would say while there may be a lot of overlap between design and engineering, there's a lot of things that engineers could learn from designers, and maybe designers could learn from engineers. And my my strong point is that we should be teaching all three methods. John, just a, uh, okay, coming from systems engineering. Okay. Okay. The things that we focus on in systems engineering are, are user requirements, development of specification requirements, yeah. and architecture, which I see as being kind of a subset under what you're using the, yeah. the term design for. Yeah. yeah, I would say some engineers, some engineers do have a very design-oriented way of working. Um, and so, I mean, Dan Moat was unconvinced by my arguments and he felt design was part of engineering. But I don't think landscape design is part of engineering. I don't think graphic design is part of engineering. And there's a lot of branches of designers and the American Institute of Graphic Art uh, and so on. Many, many fields that we usually don't think about in engineering or science, but they are growing in power and importance. There's social design as well, which we might call social engineering. Okay, so this, you know, we could argue for the the, the, the Venn diagrams to overlap a lot, or we could say they, they overlap a little, or... Okay, so here's where I've taken us, that I believe we have three new environmental contextual issues. There's two guiding principles I advocate and expose in the book, and I have whole chapters about what is science, engineering, and design, what are the cha brand challenges in each field. You go to the National Academy site and read the 14 grand challenges, you'll find a pretty interesting set of things that are different from science agendas. They may include science. And they're also, I think, different from the design agenda. Remember, the National Academy of Sciences was founded in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln. 
The National Academy of Engineering was founded in 1964, 100 years later, now celebrating its 50th year. And the National Academy of Design was built, was founded in? Not. Thank you. <laughs> I, one of the outcomes of the book is to propose that by 2064, we should have a National Academy of Design. And that would require designers to live up to the standards that I'm advocating of publishing their results and describing their work in a general theoretical way. Whereas designers, I, my critical part about designers is they often say, my design is my theory. Just look at it. You, know, you will see my theory. But I don't agree with that. I think you need, you owe the reader a story about where you got your ideas from, what you built on, what your theories are, so they can be generalized and widely applied. So I've got criticisms for everybody, but I hope I take a supportive approach to suggest if we teach our students all three methods, life will be better for our students. They will produce higher impact research results. Okay, the book has five chapters on five what I call research life cycle methods. And it's a long time to explore them. I'm gonna talk, well, and the outcomes are solutions to the problems and refined theories, okay? Um, for today, I'm just gonna talk about teams as they relate to uh, this agenda. And so, you know, our teams special, okay? And the uh, title of the chapter is Form Teams with Diverse Individuals and Organizations, okay? And again, here, you know, ISI gets good points, and Jeff is a hero in the story of bringing the close connection with industry partners who bring resources, who bring problems, and who bring living laboratories to test out the products of what ISR faculty so, Becky's nodding supportively, so I'm in. Okay, so, so team, teams are a big topic now, okay? And I guess I'll start just by asking the question, to have a little, oh, oh I see, sorry, one more, one more slide here, which says, teams are the new norm. Um, this is from 1959 to 2013, papers in science engineering used to be more than one author was about 50%. 50% were single authors, okay? And now 90% are team authors, okay? Same is true in social sciences. Even in the humanities, where the strongest tradition of single authorship remains, the evidence is very powerful that multi-author papers have higher impact. Okay, so this is a series of nice papers by uh, Brian, Uzi, um, Wupti, and Jones at Northwestern, and using science citation index, uh, citation counts, it's only one measure, I know, but it turns out in the 1950s, multiple authored papers actually had a higher rate of citations, about 1.3 times single author papers. <coughs> By 2005, it turns out multi-author papers have 2.1 times. So teamwork has not only become more the norm, but the people who do it are doing better than they used to. And I would say the internet's a strong component of that. People have learned to work in teams, and the technologies have facilitated teamwork in a much more dramatic way, whether it's shared documents or Skype or other they do the analysis both ways, both with all the references and excluding self-references. So the self-references are a factor there, but they're only a small factor, they're like 10%. Of the so it may be true, and Uzi is suggesting, if you've got a team of people working with you, they'll know more people, they'll cite themselves, they'll, they'll work it out, and they'll put more citations in. And yeah, that happens. Um, but I think the question is whether the self-references or the network they have. And the network, not just the number, but the diversity of audiences they reach. Okay, that's the power of teams. And we'll come, if we have time, we'll talk about impact. Okay, but the reason, well, I mean, why are teams a good idea is a, is a basic question. I think that's my next. Beyond one author, What's that? If you go beyond one author, I mean, two could be a divided student, I don't know if you call it yeah. a team. Yeah, so the effect increases with two, three, four, five. It gets a little weaker after five. Okay. There was a nice data point in addition by um, 
Yuri Leskovich, who was the program chair for the ACM uh, KDD Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining Conference. They had th over a thousand papers submitted. They accepted 140, 14 percent acceptance. Pretty tough. And he did a great plot. There's two two lessons out of that study. One is that the the, the ratings, the numeric ratings, went up increasingly up to five authors, and then slowed. The other thing was papers that had authors that were university and industry had statistically significantly higher ratings than either all university or all university, uh, all industry papers, authors. Isn't that cool? I mean, when your graphs change per discipline. Yes, they do. they do vary. I mean, I showed there before social sciences, and I didn't no, show you humanities. No, but, but even within science yeah. and engineering. Yeah. I, I think you'd say the outlier, there's two outliers. One is biology, which tends to have large numbers of authors, and um, particle physics, or experimental particle physics, let's say, particularly. And in fact, in recent years, there's been an explosion. Only 10 or 15 years ago, the first papers with more than 100 authors appeared, and now there are papers with thousands of authors, where the author list is 26 pages. I mean, it forced some journals to give up paper publication because they could not list the number of authors. So there's some aberrations there. There's, well, there's you know, only a few hundred papers a year that have these extreme numbers, but the numbers of those, ex you know, the frequency is, is growing. So you have those differences in disciplines, which are partially understood, but I think in computing and engineering, you see this growing trend towards more authors. Now, cynics will say, oh, that's a bad thing. You have these groups working together, and they sort of just add the names. And yeah, there's some you know, bad acting going on there, where uh, you, know, you, 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 just, you include your friends and your friends' friends <laughs> as co-authors, and they agree to do the same for you. And I think that's unfortunate, and several journals are cracking down requiring the test that every author has to sign a document that describes their role and that they could make a public presentation about the contents of the paper. Okay. I've had that problem too. I mean, the tools we develop for doing hierarchical clustering and data analysis are used in genomics, and the people we talked to, we were trying to help them use our tools, and they succeeded wonderfully. One of these is only has 18 new authors, but Myself and my student are co-authors of a paper that I could not explain to you about you know, the, 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 the um, 23 genes that play a role in muscular dystrophy. It's a statistical presentation, but our tools, they said, were essential. And we said, fine, thank me in the acknowledgments and cite my work, and I'm happy. Uh, but no, they say, you know, you have to be a co-author, otherwise our funding agencies won't believe that we are really working. So there's, you know, these different Okay, so why do we work in teams? I don't want to go too far with this, but why do we work in teams? Come on, you can tell me. Why? I think a larger pool of people means public means more interesting interaction, more diversity, more randomization in the actual process, the ability to get inputs that are not standard to your thinking. And this goes on and on. All right, that's a pretty good, strong statement about the benefits of diversity. What else? Why else do we work? You have to do all the work by yourself. Right. So the multiplier effect, which is kind of the, the, the migrant workers on the farms harvesting the apples, it's if you have 100 people, it goes faster than you have one person, right? So <laughs> uh, there's both a quantity and there's a quality aspect. Why else do we work? The, the bigger problems, which you started the whole presentation, Right. And really requires a much more interdisciplinary right. approach to, um, to solve the problem. Ah, okay. You didn't say interdisciplinary, but you did say diversity of knowledge and skills. So um, you're saying one is the big problems I'm talking about, the immense problems I'm talking about, requires some different skills. And yeah, there may be a theory skill, there may be a computing skill, a data mining skill, there may be an implementation, there may be all kinds of different things that you weave together. Yeah. And that's the raised ambition. The different scientific, right. sociology disciplines to improve us. So that's sort of related to the diversity. And I just want to come to, we can have a whole day about talking about the interdisciplinarity, which you cited. 
So I had written a whole chapter about the power of interdisciplinarity, and then I threw it out. And then it returned after a few months as a, sub, as a section of the chapter on teamwork. The evidence is not there for interdisciplinarity, okay? Evidence does not show. So, you know, if I say, if I get a computer scientist and a, you know, engineer and a, and a dance person together, okay, a dance theory person, is that, you know, is that, that's real diversity. So there's a downside to diversity. There's a downside to the size of the team also. Okay, so there are problems. And teams actually fail quite often. And because there's so many, it's quite visible. However, when they succeed, they really succeed well. And they have dramatic impacts. So there's a real advantage, but it does say we need to teach our students how to work in teams. Now, what are the aspects of working in teams? We could go on at length the communications between them, the social skills, and what kind of diversity? Did you say men and women? Well, what I mean by diversity is across all dimensions. I mean, all it's right. clear to me that uh, it means disciplines, it means uh, national origins, it means uh, academic origin, it means uh, gender. Color of hair, height, maybe, weight. Maybe you'd like to go there. <laughs> so you have a nice little graph. I okay, think but, uh, we as engineers can be a little more thoughtful and nuanced about which elements of diversity. No. For engineers to have such preoccupations. Oh, oh. So I would say a larger discussion says what kinds of diversity do you want? How about old and young? Yeah, I think that's good. Is that more important than men and women? I would know. I would know. I think you, you know, I'll put back here. So they suggest that interaction between the men and women be better than between Yes, strongly. Strongly, repeatedly. Pretty consistent one. Okay? <laughs> like, oh yeah, lots, there's lots. There's a long history, a large amount of this, but absolutely. Why is that true? You might ask. I mean, I think, well, if you want to try, why do you want that? that? That teams that involve men and women have a much, in general, overall things, have a much greater success rate. And higher citation counts, too. You mean in academia? Yeah. Because Try it, Becky. Watch out, though. <laughs> because if to be a woman in academia, you have to be pretty smart to start with, or else you, you're not going to make it, and nobody's going to listen to you. I say this from a female perspective, and so you get a lot of very, very smart women on the teams. All right. So, so that's so, one. So, is a filter so paper written by women alone, should be there also? No. 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 I think also a little bit like that. Other <laughs> factors. Come on. Go ahead. Have to do with I think, the way women are socialized. Go ahead. I think it leads to different kinds of interactions, both mm -hmm. with females as with males. And right. One can argue that this works now because we are on the ramp up of the state. But we have 20 or 30 years from now when basically we live in a so called equalized <laughs> world. Because right? I mean, there are already studies showing that even in business, for example, women behavior. Not necessarily that different from the behavior of men. So uh, the curve is in the right direction. But, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, so you have all kinds of exceptions, one way or another, yes. but pretty consistently, not pretty. I mean, very consistently, that that teams that combine men and women and industry and university types have much, much stronger performance. Partially, the communication styles and the willing to. Uh, to, to discuss and work in teams as sort of an instinct. Oh, I, we didn't get to one of the key things of why we work in teams. It's really interesting. No one's mentioned this. Anyone want to try one more? Well, very I social interaction. I mean, don't just be uh, even if you have two people from the same background. Yeah. Talking the problem out. Ah, uh, well, now you got to a further thing. The actually, it's the metacognitive awareness. That is, when you have to, when you have to explain to me what your idea is to win me over. Mm -hmm. That forces your idea to be. So actually, communications is very powerful. And that takes us out of the one person working alone sometimes can do great things. But having to explain your idea to another early on mm -hmm. is a very rich way of solidifying your ideas and clarifying your thinking. Okay? So it's very powerful just to explain. Them. And even though solitary famed figures, even like Einstein, 
you know, his wife was a, was a physicist, and you know, it's often said that she should have been given equal credit because she was the sort of sounding board for ideas. Often that's what. Now, there's a book, one of the ones that influenced me called by Joshua Schenk called The Power of Two, which makes a strong case for the two-person team with the examples of Wilver and Orville and uh, Orville and, uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and, uh, and, and Steve Wozniak and uh, Watson and Crick, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Lennon and McCartney and you know, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie. So there's a lot of power of two is seen as one strong point emphasizing this idea that talking it out to someone is a very powerful way of improving the quality of work. Okay? Talking it out to even more diverse people may have even further benefits and may bring you other solutions that are... Right, there was a study you might find at yes. Harvard, <laughs> uh, Harvard or MIT not too long ago, right? I mean, uh, showing that even within a discipline, you find that the students, for example, you find that you came from different academic institutions, for example. I don't know that one, but there's hundreds of studies. It was a study, but remarkable. Very strong and robust results. There's also personality differences where one person says, no, look, we're going to get this right. We're going to take as long as we can and do it just right, and I'm not ready to publish until then. And the other person says, look, you know, we have a deadline for this conference coming. Let's do what we can and submit to this conference. You have these different personality sides. Uh, you know, the Steve Jobs is the dreamer and Wozniak is the doer. There's the visionary and the execution personality. But these are stereotypes. And there's much richer study about the team makeups uh, in, a, in you know, many dozens of books. And, uh, Scott Pages, for those who like the engineering approach to it, his book called The Difference has you know, pretty much game theoretic analysis and simulation models that show again and again why this diversity comes through. <laughs> I wanted to ask, you know, uh, looking into this type of teamwork, have you looked into the role of a single individual main driver, uh, uh, not necessarily intellectual, but just making the team work happen. Yeah. Uh, right. You so observe that, that there is usually one person who is not necessarily a driver? Or it, it there. So leadership of teams is yet another issue. And I'm about to get to that, but um, there's also differences of teams of two to ten people are generally seen as one category, and then larger teams are yet another, where beyond ten you need much more administrative skill, and coordination, communication, that may be outside the domain of work, whereas between two to 10, generally it's seen that you need to be domain knowledgeable and maybe have some good social skills and leadership skills that inspire other people to work with you and collaborate. So, but I still want to get to one reason more while we work in teams, which I haven't heard. It's interesting, I've never, I've only one time in my history where a computer science student has given me this answer. I do this in my class for, for the last dozen years. Because it's fun, okay? If you read Watson and Crick's Double Helix, you'll see where Watson keeps celebrating the fun it was to work with Crick. If you, um, you know, if Kahneman and Tversky, okay? Kahneman repeatedly talks about the great fun of working with Tversky. Almost Tversky died, unfortunately. It's now more than 10 years ago. But, um, you know, these partnerships are fun. And in the computing fields and in many engineering fields, we tend to be more introverted in our style. And the instinct to work with others, and this is not, again, this is, this is validated. Computing actually is the highest degree of introversion of any professional study. <laughs> and data processing um, professionally. So um, our instinct that my students will say, you know, when I tell them there's teamwork to be done, they come to me the own class, a few of them will say, you know, Professor Schneiderman, this is all very good teamwork, but you know, I have another job and I have to take care of my parents and I'm doing this, could I do this project on my own? I'll do the extra work. And the answer is no. Okay, but there's a sort of repeated thought that they could do this on their own. And in fact, unfortunately, in our department, I would say, you know, um, programming is seen as a solitary effort. And it's breaking the rules to read someone else's code. And yet, in industry, you're always working in teams. And unfortunately, we have a long history, which is hard to break, and some of our faculty share that vision, that, you know, you can't read other people's code. 
and they don't encourage the collaborative work on actually more ambitious <coughs> projects, which I think is what's you know, the in a sense. Yeah. Isn't that the whole point of added development? It's a recognition. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I mean, the point is so powerful, and industry has so much figured it out that agile development has become this, you know, and other previous group strategies. Yet I don't think we have any plans for. Yeah, I'm not sure either. But, you know, I would say, uh, you know, if I had my way, but Vic Basile and I, um, you know, many of you may know him, he's retired now, but software engineering faculty. He and I visited General Electric, which at the time was <coughs> one of our, our students. And, uh, you know, after a whole day, you know, we finally said, what do you think of our students? And they said, your students are terrific, but they don't know how to work in teams. It was pretty powerful, and that was life changing for me. So I make all, more of my classes have the have lifetime to learn. That's right. I mean, it's not easy, and I have to learn that too. But I think I'm getting, I think I'm going to cruise through here. We're nearly done, and we should probably, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things about how to work in teams. A, the, the book has a dozen subsections about the strategies to work in teams and how to make it happen. And what are the, you know, what do we know about success? And then I do want to say how this is becoming a national issue. Um, I spoke at the National Institute of Health. There's a Science of Team Science conference that um, uh, I spoke at. But there was tied to the publication earlier this year this remarkable book, Enhancing the Effectiveness of Team Science, which focuses on these seven dimensions of teamwork. And we've cited a number of those here, um, you know, from Diversity from homogeneous to heterogeneous, from disciplinary integration that's quite separate, group size, whether the, everybody had the same goals or they had divergent goals, whether the boundaries were stable or fluid, proximity, how close they were to one another, um, and then task interdependence, whether they could work separately. This book is free online as a PDF from the National Academies. Um, uh, two weeks ago today, I participated in yet another downtown at the National Academy's meeting to discuss and present this, and it involved the directors of the National Science Foundation, NIH, and others about how to implement these ideas and how to make team uh, science, and I, I'm there championing and say, what about team engineering? What about team design? Okay? And, you know, those are the agendas I was uh, pushing. I think that the incentives are, I'm not disagreeing with the ah. objective, the incentives are completely the opposite direction. In general, that's true. And that's one of the things, I mean, I, I began to think in January of this year, as I was getting close to finishing this book, and I just today got the page proof, so all this is happening, it's getting close. So when I was working at the beginning of the year, I suddenly realized, you know, if I believe what I'm saying, shouldn't I try to change our own campus? Okay, and I began to do, this is the sixth, seventh talk I've done on campus about this topic, so you know, for computer science, for CMNS advisors, or for the architecture school, for all, well, you know, I've been getting around and trying it out. I've been meeting with the vice president of uh, research, uh, Pat O'Shea, Ken Gertz. Next Wednesday, I will speak for the research uh, luncheon of the vice president about these issues briefly. About particularly, I was, among the many things I'm trying to get them to do, one is teamwork. Let me address particularly your issue of the reward structure. You're right. The problem with teams in an academic environment is that hiring, promotion, and tenure are often explicitly tied to independent accomplishment. Teamwork and working with others, especially outside your own discipline, are seen, are dismissed. Or that's, that's too extreme. This, they're maybe reduced in value. You have to work doubly hard to make the case that your teamwork was actually productive and that your interdisciplinary collaboration yielded benefits not only to the other disciplines. Computer science is usually the belief that if we work with other disciplines, we're doing service to them. Whereas I think we're drawing in great problems that make for great computer science. Okay, so uh, the framework you have is quite interesting. So there are some examples of countering this. Duke University has an explicit program by which new hires, faculty hires, make a contract that says in three years when I'm going to be reviewed and six years when I'm up for tenure, here's my agenda. I'm going to be publishing in these interdisciplinary places. I'm going to be working with these different disciplines. 
And here are the faculty members I want to be on my review committee three or six years. It's only partially effective, but it's an interesting one. University of Southern California has a stronger policy, which explicitly requires faculty to keep a portfolio of their collaborations and their contributions in each case, and they explicitly value the collaborations that you have, rather than sort of pushing it aside or ignoring it. So getting this campus to change is one of those agendas. Another, I think I'm getting close to it. How do you enforce this on someone who does the algebraic geometry? Yeah. Well, um, um, you enforce it by positive rewards for those who do it. I said NSF is now giving awards for theorists working with practitioners. I understand, but there are areas where that's simply, simply not feasible. Uh, I think that's wrong. Algebraic geometry, I'd like to hear your proposal for collaboration with the social scientists. Doesn't have to be social so, science. Give me, give me a plausible Algebraic topology, I think, has lots of applications, not only in cybersecurity and algorithms there, but I think in many, many so fields. You, you view this as a collaboration. I would view this so, as simply as an extension of what you would be doing anyway. Does, if a computer scientist theoretician works with a computer scientist um, systems person, is that interdisciplinary? But it depends on the level is of that a collaboration? It depends on the level of interaction. I, mean, I don't think you have to go to dance, but, no, you know, but computational then, biology. No, but then I think it becomes extremely <coughs> formal and. Uh, but look yeah, at the, so many examples of network theorists working with social scientists yeah, working but with. Uh, give me an example of someone who's a let's say uh, someone who does not theory. Someone who, I don't know what it's not theory, it's a branch of mathematics. Okay. No, not theory. <laughs> not theory. Right? Uh, I don't know enough to comment. I guess I was thinking about network, uh, you know, Barabasi, for yeah, example. That, that, that's easy. Right? I mean, <laughs> no, that's easy to see where, where it would happen. But I can see that there are disciplines. I mean, my it wife is a right. historian, right. right? She's a uh, right. Romanist art and century. I find it very, very difficult to, uh, to see where she would uh, collaborate in a way that would be meaningful to her. Have you heard about Dutra Pima? Yeah, yeah, she, she moans and groans about that. Well, that's a traditional story of you. I think she's got some things to learn. Yeah, Send maybe, her my best maybe, regards. Maybe, but, uh, but, but tell her if the causes, or the, the, I know exactly what you're saying. What about if the cause is presented, but the result of that is not really crucial for the whole program to go forward? So it's a problem that is presented that that person can work on it on his or her own. But not necessarily the other components are directly dependent on those results. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I mean, uh, sure, I'm sympathetic and you can find examples yeah. and so on, but I think if you open your mind to these possibilities, you'll find advantage. Yeah, let, let me just sum up and just say one I other. It depends on the level of collaboration. You know, I just want to close with this idea uh, that I've been trying to promote around campus about some changes. Uh, and, and Marianne Rankin, the provost, gave me a glowing endorsement for the book of saying, you know, these are great ideas, beautifully presented, and I'm going to put them in my strategic plan. So I think I'm sort of finding the right places to make this intervention. So here's yeah, the issue of that, and I hope next, uh, I don't know if any of you are coming to the research luncheon next Wednesday, but it's to honor the research leaders around campus. And uh, you may know, it's been poorly advertised, but I succeeded. A uh, summer project was to work on the idea of how you promote your work here, and how you tell stories. And for example, the first award that they are giving on next Wednesday will be to the faculty who have written publicly as op-ed articles in the New York Times or Time Magazine or other public-facing places about the work they've done here. Now, I've also been encouraging, for example, Wikipedia. We've talked about this. I'm pleased to hear a warm response. And Becky also. But during the summer, I succeeded to get two of my colleagues, Ashok Agarwala and Bill Visage, to create a Wikipedia page about their work. Okay, And it's a very interesting exercise. It forces you to think about what about your work is important understandable to a wide range of people. And often, you have to pass Wikipedia's notability test 
So they both their pages got taken down by the Wikipedia administrators. They didn't at first seem to satisfy the notability test, but as they collected the stories about how their work had impact and importance, their pages now are up and they seem to be there. So they're not being taken down. And I work, I mean, ISR is on its way, but computer science did add a Wikipedia page. I'm still struggling with UMIAX, but CMNS added a Wikipedia page. And on this campus, I mean, I spoke to Marianne Rankin about, only eight of the 12 colleges have Wikipedia pages. And of those, four of them are pretty weak. And one of the things that we, yeah. Becky led this whole initiative was to have our faculty individual media on their website. And even though it's not like Wikipedia, yeah. but it's also another way of really expressing from your own perspective, yeah. your own voice, you know, what your research is all about. Right. And, and this has been extremely attractive to our students. Can you I tell me what the number of views are for these? That we yeah. can. I, in fact, I'm going to have to look. I, I do encourage you to look. Yeah. Because it's great to produce a video, yeah. but if you don't drive traffic to it, we have. We have. Because is I, it 200 or 2,000? Well, I, know. I think you need to be thinking about okay. it. Okay. Okay. Right. And the Twitter stream. Maryland Research, UMB Research, has 2,200 followers, which is okay. Harvard University Research, Twitter, has 50 times that. Oh, of course. Of course, but why should they be 50 times? Can't we be at least a tenth of a Harvard? Why don't we be a 50th of a Harvard? Okay, so I'm trying to work with Ken Yurtz and about how do we make Wikipedia, how do we make Twitter, how do we make our own home pages better to tell our story in wider ways? Does this matter? See, it was easy. No, I'm far going to make a connection to with you. This doesn't we matter. Have to make a connection with you. No, I never said it. Okay, no, this is, uh, what the connection was is here. I'm taking, there's five principles or five chapters. So I've moved on here. The way, the best way to promote adoption of your work however you measure it by citations, by other things, downloads, is by writing well. Mm -hmm. Well-written papers That's right. and various tests and evidence are read and cited more often and downloaded. What is your view of review papers? Review papers are very effective. It's not my opinion. Review papers in general have high citation points. And so that's a good well, idea. Well-written well ones. Well 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 you say well-written ones. Yeah. So that's, that is another strategy for visibility. It's, Again, some of our scholars will look down on review papers, but I think good review papers actually advance thinking, reframe the discipline, and do very positive things. Well, like so I want to close with ben, one little ben, story in here. Ben, it's yeah. like with every metric, it has to be understood. Uh, it has to, you cannot just take it you know, as a blank check, it seems to me. Sure. A bit. And there's no single metric that does it, and no combination, and there's a strong alt metrics groups that are alternative metrics and then there are groups that are against metrics and want qualitative review only of quality these are very i mean i discussed these at length but let me close with one little idea about propagation of your work some of you may have heard this before it's called send five and thrive okay and the idea is for faculty students for all of you you finished the paper it's gotten reviewed you revise the paper, you're bound to submit it for publication. Two weeks you get to submit it for publication. Go to your paper, look at the five, look at the references, and select the five most important people who you cite, whose work is known, or the impact on you, and so Get their emails. Send them an email that says, Dear Professor So-and-so, I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. Working with Professor Ben Schneider. Who is he? <laughs> um, we have a paper which is going to be submitted for publication in two weeks. We've cited your work. Okay? We have two questions for you. One, have we been fair in describing your contribution? And two, are there any more recent works of yours that we should cite? Now, when I tell this to my students, they say, my gosh, if I should write to this world famous professor, at Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, and I said, yeah, you're a professional, you're publishing a paper, you're a student grad student, you're a graduate of the University of Maryland, you should be able to write to these people. And they say, oh, they won't reply. 
Well, my experience is that 80% reply in 24 hours. Okay, why? Because it's a very kind, social, positive thing to do. You're informing them about your work, you're telling them their work is great, and you're asking for clarification about if you're being fair in citing their contribution. You're improving the quality of your work. I think it's a great idea. And of course, now they know about you and they will cite your work, more or less, okay? Now, there's a secondary effect here of these principles is that when my students think, oh, I have to send this letter to Professor X, Y, Z, they say, oh my gosh, I have to see what I said. And they realize they wrote their paper that said, Professor XYZ failed to do X, Y, to do ABC. This paper corrects that omission. And they say, oh my God, I can't send that. I'd be embarrassed to do that. Well, there's of course a simple fix. You could say, Professor XYZ's pioneering work can be extended and amplified by the techniques proposed in this paper. It's the same thing. It's a matter of whether you're going negative, a tendency for students and young faculty to do, to assert their prominence by going negative. And it's the wrong idea. If you're a member of a community, if you identify yourself, if you go social, if you think in this public way, you will know the power of saying positive things. Probably a good place to end, uh, but I think, let's see, what do I got here? Oh yes, apply to basic combined, Achieving breakthrough collaborations, asking bigger questions, <laughs> analysis based on creativity, and actively build connections. Your network is the best predictor of your impact. And then Rita Colwell is a longer story, but if you are as good as Rita Colwell, uh, you'll have my admiration. She's the hero in my stories about Maryland. Anyway, I hope that's good. Thank you for coming this afternoon.